think we'll get started. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the LevNet webinar on cryptocurrency and blockchain from TradFi to DeFi. As I'm sure you all know, this is a very hot and booming topic right now. From meme stocks to NFTs to new currencies, crypto is all over the news. We're hoping that through this webinar, we'll answer some of your questions and clarify the fundamentals of cryptocurrency and blockchain. My name is Yara Kiki, and I'm honored to be your moderator today. I'm a software engineer at Robinhood and have been a member of LevNet's Early and Career Steering Committee for the past year. We've been planning some exciting events for early and career high tech professionals of Lebanese descent. Today's LevNet webinar is part of an ongoing series of webinars that LevNet has been running on several interesting topics, ranging from 5G and digital transformation to the challenges and rewards of entrepreneurship in an early career setting to the impact of COVID-19. If you've missed any of the LevNet webinars, I strongly encourage you to watch them. They're all on, on YouTube, as will this webinar be in 24 hours. So first, a few housekeeping items. Everyone other than the panelists will be muted. At any time, if you have questions, please send them via the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll select a few at the end, uh, hopefully for 20 minutes at the end of the webinar. Um, and if you have any logistical issues, please send a chat to Janine Akiki, our LevNet Executive Director. So now for the fun stuff. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce our impressive panel members. Shanna Haas, a VP of Business Development at Ava Labs, and Sarah Reynolds, co-founder of She256. Let's start off with um, each of you giving a short intro on yourself and what you do. First, John. Uh, hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, special thanks to LevNet and been following for a long time. And Yara, thanks for moderating. Um, as Yara mentioned, I'm John Nehas, uh, Vice President and Head of Business Development at Ava Labs. We are the uh, licensed service provider of the Avalanche blockchain. Um, so we created Avalanche as open source, and our job is to support the growth of the Avalanche blockchain. Um, so I have two mandates as head of business development. One is the growth of the Avalanche ecosystem. Uh, that's through wallets. So qualified custody, uh, mobile wallets, web wallets, any kind of wallets, exchanges, uh, assets, so stable coins, tokenized securities, any kind of asset that can live on the Avalanche blockchain. And finally, applications, uh, primarily focused on decentralized finance applications. Um, that's on the Avalanche side. On the Avalab side as a firm, we also uh, support enterprises, Fortune 500s, and other um, kind of enterprises to build on the Avalanche blockchain, or we partner with them to build for them. So that's kind of my, my role over here. Thank you, John. Uh, Sarah? Oh, hi, guys, um, and thanks. Yara for moderating and having us today. Um, my name is Sarah. I um, began learning about crypto and blockchain um, right out of high school. Um, and so started my blockchain journey throughout college. Um, that's when I also started a nonprofit called She256, where we aim to get more women and underrepresented minorities into the space. Um, Outside of that, I also work as an engineer at um, a decentralized exchange called Uniswap. And, um, you know, just in general, I think within the world of crypto, there are a lot of different themes that I've been really excited about um, and, and probably that we'll get into today, but just a couple. Um, one being how kind of crypto reshapes ownership, um, you know, and empowering those to actually own um, assets. Two being um, talking about new forms of exchange and transfer of value. Um, and then three is also uh, kind of this pipeline of talent from web two to web three. Um, and, and that's like a lot of what I do at um, my nonprofit. So really excited to um, you know, also do this with John and, and learn about um, Avalanche. So yeah, this will be fun. Awesome, thank you, Sarah. Um, so now for some questions, we'll start off with John. Um, what is the main difference between traditional finance, so TradFi, and decentralized finance, DeFi? And then as a follow-up question, what are the key differences between cryptocurrency and traditional money? So TradFi or traditional finance is what everybody's accustomed to, right? That's your banks, that's your payment processors, that's everybody that you interact with on a daily basis that either holds your money for you, allows you to spend your money, allows you to invest your money. Um, the regulatory bodies that sit in between the, the rent seekers or the middlemen, such as the banks and everybody else. Uh, with decentralized finance or DeFi, 
aims to do is to remove the middleman, right? So that value over the internet, as the internet kind of was there initially to transfer information between people, DeFi exists to transfer value so that you can send funds peer to peer. You can invest in new projects. You can exchange one token or one, one, one unit of value for another without a, without a centralized party, right? Without a bank, you can hold on to, or crypto allows you to hold on to your own value, right? Through custodial, non-custodial, mobile wallets, any kind of wallets, you have the ability to hold on to your own money. What DeFi allows you to do is to transact in that money without the bank. We're all familiar with how this works. You go to the bank, you give them $100. They hold that into an account for you. That $100, then they go loan out to everybody else. They charge an interest. They give you a very small interest and they keep the profits. Uh, they tell you what you can invest in, what you can invest in, what you can spend your money on, what you can't spend your money on. Decentralized finance, the ultimate goal, in my opinion, is the empowerment of the individual to do with, with their own funds and money to do with it as they see fit, right? So DeFi allows peer-to-peer -peer lending and borrowing. So instead of me going to a bank, giving them $100, Sarah going to the bank and borrowing um, you know, $50, her paying the bank, the bank paying me and, and managing that, we can do that on a, on a, on a near peer-to-peer -peer basis with the intermediary only being a smart contract or, you know, uh, or, or, a lot, or code that, that sits there and removes the middleman, right? And the intermediary, you know, um, Sarah's company Uniswap was revolutionary in creating an automatic, automated market maker and decentralized exchange where people can exchange value for other value, one token for another or a dollar state peg stable coin for another without having to go to a centralized exchange and doing that whole process uh, that exists there. So you know, DeFi ultimately, I think, is empowering the individual to be able to do with their, with their money as they see fit and is really kind of the cutting edge of innovation, right? Um, I see traditional finances being here. It's slow. It's, it's kind of uh, hard to innovate. There's entrenched interests. There's lobbyists. There's a million things. And on the flip side, you have DeFi, which is super innovative, creating new products across you know, trading, borrowing, lending, synthetics, derivatives, and any kind of financial product. And hopefully the goal being that DeFi really is a magnet of innovation to push traditional finance towards a more decentralized state. Um, and then, sorry, what was the second part in terms of the role of crypto? I mean, the difference between uh, cryptocurrency and traditional money, but you've, you've definitely covered that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, traditional money, we all know this, right? It's, it's, it's printed and backed by, by, by the sovereignty uh, of, a, of a nation state or central bank. Um, crypto allows people to hold onto their value themselves. Uh, the, the transfer of value is no longer controlled by a sovereign entity, by a middleman or a rent seeker. It's kind of created a, a, as the market dictates and allows for people to do with it as they please. Awesome. Thank you for that great definition. Um, Sarah, are there any other advantages that you see um, with cryptocurrency and then maybe even disadvantages associated with it? Yeah, um, I, I can start with the, the first piece there, like advantages, which I think John kind of touched on already. Um, so, you know, if we're talking about money as, you know, sort of a consistent store of value, like you can have many definitions for money, but if you're talking about it as a consistent store of value, um, you know, crypto also enables this and more, right? So you have, like John mentioned, things like stable coins, USDC, DAI, um, and and the advantage of of holding it here is that true ownership. So you know, you can actually like have the ability to self custody your assets. So you truly own them. You own their keys. Um, and then two, you also get all of the advantages of being in the DeFi ecosystem. So passive income exposure by using like yield enabling protocols and things like that, while also still holding on to that dollar value. Um, so I think um, that that's, that's kind of one side as like this like store of value and like value generation. And then on the other side, if we're talking about money as like a means of, of transferring that value or of like purchasing things, um, I think the, the main thing that comes to mind here is that crypto is really fast. So, um, you know, you, we could talk about bank transfers, like both like domestically and internationally it could take up to like a week. I, and I'm sure everyone here has experienced that, um, you know, with USDC and DAI, you can send money cross borders in the matter of however long it takes to, um, you know, execute that transaction on, on whatever chain, you know, USDC would be you know, on Ethereum, it's something like uh, five, 10 minutes. Um, so I think there's there's that advantage. 
Um, but then, you know, uh, the kind of the themes that John talked about before is just um, in summarizing, it's this permissionless open source financial system that you now have access to when you've um, kind of enabled that ownership through USDC or DAI or any of these other stable coins. Um, and, and that being said, like you said, Yara, like what, what are some of the disadvantages here? Um, you know, there's always things that you do need to be careful of when using crypto. And uh, there are like a lot of difficulties, especially in terms of like onboarding fiat to crypto and lots of steps involved. And also thinking about like a lot of the transaction costs can be like getting really expensive on certain chains. Um, it, I also like tell people that it's expensive if you, if you mess up something um, just because there's a lot of like high stakes, uh, you know, with sending a transaction or using a wallet for the first time or anything like that. Um, but I think the main thing is that there's a lot of responsibility that comes with truly owning your own assets. And so, um, you know, thinking about like proper security measures to take, um, you know, being aware of phishing or scam tokens, um, you know, there are a lot of people that take advantage of new users. And so um, I think that's the, the main thing to be aware of. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, John, uh, what are the um, what is the role of cryptocurrency for developing countries? You know, you mentioned like no more government and, you know, what, what do you see as the future for developing countries? So just to backtrack real quick and add to something Sarah said in terms of disadvantages, and this will apply to, I think, developing countries, is that the, the learning curve is a little high, right, for crypto. Um, there is a floor that you need to be comfortable with. Uh, whether it's Web3 or MetaMask or setting up a wallet and your your, your key phrase, you know, your, your seed phrase and 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 managing keys and, and all these things have a little bit of a learning curve that, you know, a, a retailer or average user isn't very familiar with. I think the challenges for developing countries uh, or the benefits for, for developing countries is that people can hold on to their value. We've seen this now clearly in Lebanon where the government is incapable of managing anything um, and the currency has been devalued, the same in Venezuela, the same in Nigeria. So the ability for people to kind of transact outside of the financial system that is kind of, um, you know, tied to the political system of the country is something revolutionary, right? Um, you know, especially with DeFi, right? I, how to think about that. Like you can trade, you can borrow and lend against with people, right? And we saw this back in the day with micro, financing, how that boomed in developing countries. I think these decentralized finance applications, as well as crypto in general, you know, really opens that up for people. You know, you have corrupt governments, you have uh, you know, inefficiencies, you have technological barriers that don't allow them to. And I just like, you know, back in the day in Lebanon or anywhere else, you know, some countries leapfrogged landlines and went straight to uh, cell phones, right? So the ability for these same people to leap, not leapfrog, but just bypass their country's traditional financial system, which is either corrupt, stacked against them, or is just you know too expensive to transact on, allows them to hold on to their value, allows them to transact on their value. I mean, there's something I think in DeFi that's really exciting that we don't talk about very often, is that especially with borrowing and lending, in some cultures, there's a stigma to borrowing money, right? The bank knows how much I owe them. They can always hold that over my head. You might have to borrow money from friends and family. That's a stigma. With decentralized finance, you're borrowing from an anonymous, pseudo anonymously from someone else that's pseudo anonymous. So you're taking away kind of societal stigmas that exist. So that's beneficial for developing companies, uh, countries and their people. You're allowing them to hold on to their own value, right? I think the biggest challenge is kind of abstracting away that difficulty with, with using crypto, right? Um, so whenever I do panels, people ask me this question or, uh, you know, people ask me, how do I explain crypto to my mom? I, I don't. Uh, it's not going to happen. Um, so my, my, my question is always in the reverse. It's do you know how banks work? Right. Do you know how your uh, PayPal or Zelle or Venmo work? Do you know if they use ACH or Swift or SEPA or what? You don't need to. Right. You just know that there's an infrastructure behind it. And I think the biggest challenge for developing countries and for people like myself and for Sarah, ultimately, in the next iteration or the next future is making these things, abstracting away the complexities of the technology and making it more user friendly. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I love how you brought it to the to Lebanon's financial crisis. I'm just curious um, if, you know, obviously, maybe it could have prevented it, but is there anything 
Do you see it maybe helping Lebanon or countries like Venezuela who've been through a crisis in the future or? Yes and no. Um, I, I was actually just in Lebanon too. I was, I was abroad and anytime I'm in Los Angeles, anytime I go over the Atlantic, it's, it's, it's easy. It makes it easy to pop in. And uh, I was there a couple of years ago and, and definitely has changed. And the situation has changed. The sentiment has changed. Um, you know, cashing out some dollars for Lira was difficult because I didn't have enough pockets to stuff it all in. Uh, it's just impractical at this point, and it's 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 kind of embarrassing. Uh, could it have helped? Absolutely. I think I think it could have helped the most if people had been in the system before their system fell, mm -hmm. because they would have had something to fall back on. Uh, going forward, I think it could be used to build a new or better financial system that's more transparent, that people could see where the money is and where it's going and and, and how it's being used. Um, the pessimist in me says it's not going to happen because too many hands are in that cookie jar. And for it to actually happen, there would need to be buy-in and those hands won't get cookies. So, uh, you know, there's, there, they, there's still a gatekeeper aspect unless the people who we know are always very active uh, just decide to band together for once and kind of bypass the system altogether. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I guess you mentioned, um, you know, one of the obstacles that I guess... Um, like that sort of like education around, you know, crypto. Um, are there any obstacles to both of you? Are there any other obstacles you see for crypto moving forward? Sarah, you want to go, go for it, John? Or yeah. Either you way. Go. You take it away. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the on-ramping experience is a huge obstacle, especially if our goal is to get, you know, more um, global adoption. Um, but I, I think with that, there's like other things. There's like the mobile experience. Like right now, it's very much a, a web experience. So I think that's going to be something that we'll see a lot more of. Um, uh, some more obstacles are like in terms of scalability. So that's why we're seeing a lot more like other chains pop up. Um, how can we do 10x, 100x the number of transactions that we're currently doing now in a very scalable manner? Um, I think another big thing is thinking about identity on these chains. So, um, you know, as it is now, you can be, you know, pseudonymous, um, have as many accounts or, um, uh, yeah, have as many accounts as, as you want. Um, so there's no real way of track of, of linking like one identity to one account. Um, but while also having um, kind of those anonymity properties. So I think that's a really big thing. Um, that's being explored. Um, and, and then also privacy, which is very closely intertwined with identity, but so it's sort of like the trade-off between those two. And I think in the next like couple of years, we'll see a lot more um, really interesting solutions here. Um, but all of those are, are all ob obstacles to adoption, especially like worldwide adoption. Yeah, I'll just jump in and say, you know, the biggest thing is definitely the unwrapping of fiat currencies into crypto, ultimately you still have to connect a bank uh, or a method of payment to go from dollars or lira or whatever currency into a crypto. Um, you're starting to see native kind of uh, internet money pop up. Uh, so, you know, you have your stable coins, which are dollar pegged like USDC or USDT or, or algorithmically like DAI, um, but you're starting to see new things pop up. Um, there's a new protocol that's out on Ethereum and on Avalanche called Abracadabra Money. Then they have a stable coin called Magic Internet Money. You're starting to see kind of just this situation occurring, but ultimately, um, yeah, it's getting the dollars or getting the money into the system to able to, to kind of flywheel it into the separate thing. That's where regulation is, is, is hampering things um, and slowing it down or, or lack of regulation for that matter um, is kind of an obstacle. Interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I guess a lot of people are very bullish on crypto. Some are very skeptical. Um, so I know we covered a little bit about uh, maybe like the best case scenario, like long term. Um, I'm curious about um, like maybe the worst case scenario long term. Sarah, you want to kick Both, it off? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's so funny you asked this question because I think it's... Um, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I personally see this question as I don't think there is a downhill from here. Like I would say that where we're at, there's already been so much success that like, even if everything stopped tomorrow, I would like, you know, celebrate like what we've accomplished so far. And, um, you know, I, I think that like the only real, like horrible thing I could, I could think of is like a massive exploit at like a protocol 
or like, you know, chain level where there's, you know, like infinite amount of loss of funds um, and just like total collapse. Of, I mean, it, it would literally be like a total economic collapse of this like new model. Um, I, I guess that'd be like the worst case scenario, but I still think that like to date, um, you know, what we've done so far is like a really great accomplishment. So I don't really see like a quote unquote worst case scenario other than you know, like a massive loss of funds. Um, and then, yeah, as we talked about before, like best case scenario is to just have a wider adoption of users, more talent move over web two to web three. Um, and, uh, you know, in order to build out the space in a more like global setting. Um, yeah. And, and also I think wider adoption, not even in terms of just like a store of value, but wider adoption of like DAOs. So, you know, decentralized autonomous organizations, um, which are definitely getting really hot right now, but how do we make that more practical, especially in like a real world context? Um, I, I'm really excited to see where that goes. Yeah, I think um, worst, worst case scenario is over-regulation, just heavy, because until now we don't have the regulatory clarity uh, globally, I think, you know, the, the concern is that in order to do some regulation that they might do over, they, they might overregulate, um, which could stifle innovation and be uh, a little, have a dampening effect on, on kind of the innovation that's going on. Um, but in terms of worst case scenarios, I don't think there really is one that's that bad. Um, you can't turn this thing off, right? You cannot turn Bitcoin off, Ethereum off, Avalanche off. You can't turn these chains off. I mean, there's some chains you can't turn off because they're very centralized. I'm not going to get into that, but true decentralized chains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Avalanche, and, and, and some others, you can't you, you turn off the entire internet of the world. You cannot do that. That's the that's the joy of, of decentralized systems uh, and distributed systems is you just can't do it. Um, I do agree that there are, there are exploits, but look, people look at crypto with such kind of negativity when something bad happens, and it's like you know, take the take the take the log out of your own eye. Like, it, oh, there might be an exploit. Yeah, but there wasn't there, wasn't there a scheme by Bernie Madoff? Wasn't there Enron? Wasn't there everything else? Um, you know, and the biggest negativity, I think, is just incumbent bias, right? People don't get it. There's, uh, the, you know, uh, VHS salespeople never didn't understand DVDs until they were out of a job. The fax machine people didn't understand, uh, you know, emails, Paul Krugman notably criticizing you know, things like that. It just, you know, it's, it's an incumbent bias that exists in all established systems. The, I can go talk to any of, my, any of my friends that work in traditional finance and, and any of the hedge funds and banks, they'll say the same thing, right? One, it's a threat to their system. And two, they just don't get it because they have to change the way they work. So uh, I think ultimately they're going to catch up or they're going to be left behind. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Um, and Sarah, um, now to talk a little bit more about blockchain, can you just explain the fundamentals of blockchain um, to us now that we've talked about the overarching? Yeah, yeah um, I love this question and hate it at the same time because it's an entire course like to learn uh, blockchain fundamentals. Um, but I think like a good place to start is to zoom out a little bit like, oh, blockchain, it's such a, um, you know, buzzword um so yeah to zoom out a little bit a blockchain is really just um it's really just a type of database so there are a million different types of databases we have centralized databases distributed databases no sql relational cloud database like a million different kinds of databases and so the two key ones to, to talk about today are centralized databases, um, which is really just data stored in one location. So, you know, one person controls a spreadsheet and inputs data into different columns, just like a centralized ledger. Um, and then there's distributed databases, which is, okay, a couple people manage a spreadsheet and it's in different locations spread out over multiple devices. Um, so this is key because that's what a blockchain is really just a very specific type of distributed database. So, and, and it differs from, you know, other distributed databases in the way that it organizes data. Um, and so the way that it organizes data is um, really just through these, uh, these sort of signed blocks of data. So you can kind of imagine, um, you know, as time goes on, um, 
and and as there's more data to be put in a database, um, all all a blockchain is really doing is um, holding some amount of data where one of the fields in this you know block references previous data, and so you get this sort of chain of blocks kind of building on some history of data, um, and. And this is all distributed, so there's all sorts of different kinds of nodes um, or you know computers, you know, holding this state. And um, you know, hence you, you kind of get you kind of I'm sort of building a picture here of why it's called a blockchain. But you end up having this um, you know historical data set of these like chains of blocks of data, each building on a previous state. Um, and so there's there's a ton of other pieces that we could go into, like you know what. You know how how do you decide what data gets put into the block? Um, how do you decide you know what block becomes like the truthful state or like you know which chain um, you know becomes the truthful state? Um, this is it's referred to as like a consensus mechanism. Um, you know there are, which is an entirely kind of you know uh, class on itself because there's just so many different types of consensus mechanisms: proof of stake, proof of work. Um, which maybe even John could talk a little bit about um, with with Avalanche, but um, you know all of these are you know areas of study in in themselves, and so I at this point you know kind of recommend re, you know researching the different types of consensus mechanisms and how um, different chains that are all this you know just distributed uh, database um, come to consensus on what the state of history is, because um, you could get very deep here. Um, but yeah, I don't know if John, you want to add anything on there. All right, I'm gonna take a stab at this. Um, yeah, I'm go for it. I'm not, I'm not the most technical person, um, but to, to Sarah, Sarah highlighted a lot of these things perfectly. Um, so thanks, Sarah. Um, you know, there's there's a term that's used on, for blockchains that initially I didn't use to like, but I use now more often is DLT or distributed ledger technology, because in essence that's what it is. It's a distributed ledger. So I'm gonna take a different approach and use kind of consensus as an explanation. So there's only been three class. Uh, types of consensus in history. And this is going to be somewhat of a plug for Avalanche. So I'm, I'm going to be a little biased because it's kind of how I, I go about explaining this. Uh, traditionally, since the 70s, there was classical consensus, right? That's what um, Visa and MasterCard and all distributed systems use. They allow certain nodes of a network to come in. They choose the nodes. Those nodes validate consensus. Yes, 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 yes. It's done. So think of it like a credit card transaction, right? That's a transaction hash that's you know, rolled up and, and, and goes into the network and the participants of that network, Visa allows you to be a, a merchant or not, or the payment processor allows you to be a merchant or not, right? And you're then a member of that network, those guys accept. That was from like the seventies, right? That's been around for a long time. The true breakthrough was Nakamoto consensus in 2008, right? So instead of saying you have to be able to allow or choose who's a participant in this network or decentralized or, or system, it became decentralized. So anybody could be a participant. Anybody can hold a ledger. And my ledger and all of our ledgers are public. I am pseudo-anonymous, but the ledgers are public. And there's no longer a barrier to entry. It, the only barrier being that you need to run a computer device that runs these algorithms or hard computational algorithms, which is your kind of proof of work. You have to do work to be a participant of the system. And in order, in being a participant, you validate transactions. And if, as a reward for your validation, you're paid in the token of that network being Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, since then, you're seeing a lot of new chains adopt proof of stake. Proof of stake, instead of having a hardware requirement, you have a monetary or, 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 or token requirement. So it's more of you own, an, you own a certain amount of a token, you can stake it, Kind of like put your flag, you know, put your flag down, and then you get a vote with some barrier. Now you might not have enough, so you delegate it to another yeah. node. But the participation of nodes is contingent upon a certain amount of of, of, of tokens in the system. Ethereum has, uh, you know, greatly began the work to transition to a proof of stake model. Avalanche, uh, as the layer one blockchain, utilizes the Avalanche consensus, which is to us a revolutionary new layer one, which achieves decentralization with over 1100 validator nodes uh, in, less, in a little over a year, but with the speed and throughput, uh, so it's cheaper and faster, of course, than, than Bitcoin and, and proof of work chains. And you're starting to see a migration away from proof of work because it's expensive, it's slow, 
and it's unsustainable for the environment. So, um, you know, I used to like to joke that we've kind of reverse engineered the problem of banks. If you're going to send a $200 transaction on, on some proof of work system, it could cost 30 to 80 to 100 bucks. So you're actually caught spending more than you would, but you don't have to deal with the bank. Um, you're seeing this in new layer ones, whether it be Avalanche or Algorand or Solana um, that are really kind of, um, you know, maxim maximizing faster transactions, cheaper transactions, different ones kind of give up different things. Uh, some give up on decentralization for lower fees and for faster transactions. Others don't. Uh, you know, we believe, of course, at Avalanche that, that we've solved the blockchain dilemma. Yeah, and you're talking about proof of stake and proof of work, and you know how that should keep it safe. Is it possible to, you know, uh, for it to be counterfeit um, and or you know played with in, in any way? So, I know on proof of work systems, I think they're they're 51 percent safety. Sorry, can talk better about this, but you're going to have to control a lot of this network. And at this point, with Bitcoin, that's billions and billions of dollars. Same with Ethereum. Uh, Avalanche has an 80 80 percent safety threshold. So. You would have to control, meaning own, meaning spend billions of dollars to take over the network in order to, to, to kind of fork it or, or do kind of a, a security attack against it. But this is definitely more for Sarah than for me. Um, yeah, you're, you're right, John. With, with proof of work systems, it's um, a 51% threshold. So that basically meaning you would have to own 51% of the network to um, uh, essentially control the the state of the history or the chain. Makes sense. So it's, it's really hard, basically. It, it's kind <laughs> of counterintuitive, right? You would have to probably have, I don't know, Bitcoin's over a trillion, let's say $510 billion in order to destroy it. And in doing so, you destroy yourself. So or you, you lose your own value. So. Yeah. And since we're talking about safety and um, I'm just curious, uh, why is crypto so popular with all these like recent cyber uh, ransom attacks? As you know, the, the choice of monetary. Reward. For the same reason that drug dealers and arms dealers use cash. I mean, you really want to, I mean, this, this goes back to like, you know, that incumbent bias, like what's the most used currency for, for anything less in the world, US dollars, paper US dollars. Um, Cause it's easy. You don't, you don't have to have someone throw cash in a black bag and drop it off on a street corner. You can just send it from a wallet to another. However, what people don't talk about is that you can see where that, where those funds went from that wallet to the next wallet. And you can track the genesis of those funds out to wherever they've been distributed. Those wallets can be blacklisted. There's ways to get around that. It's just the media loves to harp on it, I think. Makes sense. Um, yeah, and I have one more question for Sarah, and I know somebody actually in the Q&A also touched on it. So your work with C256 is so impressive. Um, and my question was just um, if you have like, if you can share specific applications of blockchain led by women in the space. And I know one of the Q&A questions was just more around the background, um, you know, either technical or non-technical background of, you know, people in C256 and, you know, what they what they do. Yeah. Um, as far as the, I think I, I saw that question in the Q&A, as far as the background, um, I'd say we have a really good split between technical and non-technical, which is awesome. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure about exact numbers, um, but with regards to like the wider She256 community and as well as like company partners that try to hire from She256, there's like a really fair amount of both non-technical and technical um, roles and community members. Um, as far as like other women and kind of uh, minority founders or leaders in this space, um, I can list maybe like a couple projects off the top of my head that I can think about um, in terms of the kind of like Ethereum ecosystem. Um, Open is an options protocol that was founded, um, co-founded by three people, two of which are women in the space. Um, Orca protocol has uh, is another it's sort of a DAO tooling um, a DAO tooling startup they have a, a female co-founder the graph has um, it's like an indexing protocol that has a, a really cool female director zero x project a decentralized exchange I know and then I know there's a ton of like other chains and layer ones and layer twos that um, have got a fair bit of representation as well so parity 
Optimism, Apricot, Lightning Labs. Um, oh gosh, there's like so many of them. I could I could drop some of these in the chat if people wanted to kind of research some of these projects. Um, but yeah, there's uh, you know certainly some awesome um, female developers and PMs and things like that. And and also I'd say a fair amount of investors as well. Um, so I, I do think there's like still a lot of work to be done here, but that being said, there is a lot of really awesome people doing great stuff already. Um, yeah, I hope that awesome. answered the question. Yeah, definitely. It'd be co really cool if you could put that a few in the chat. Um, totally. On to, oh, I can type it. it. Yeah, awesome. And I know Sarah might have to leave early. Um, so just let us know when you need to, but uh, we have some like about 20 minutes left for Q&A. So if you have anything, please um, ask them. I see we already have uh, really interesting ones. I'll start. Um, so countries need to tax in order to run their country. How can countries tax in a DeFi peer-to-peer -peer system uh, where they do not have visibility of, mon of money flow? Whoever would like to, to answer. Sarah, you start with this one. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, I thought about this. I saw this in the chat and I couldn't really come up with a good answer. And then I thought of DAOs. So in an ideal world, um, at least the one I'm hoping to achieve, um, things are governed with DAOs. And so you're able to, I guess it, it might be a totally different model than a tax, but how DAOs at least right now operate is um, they manage um you know, large amounts of money in a treasury and uh, the people that run the DAOs, um, you know, own a, own a token or some, um, some, yeah, either ERC-20 token or, you know, something to represent their stake in this treasury and are able to vote on, you know, building things or like, you know, public goods that otherwise maybe a tax would be used for. Um, so yeah, I guess to answer your question, I see this as being a way, you know, an application of where a DAO might be able to come in and, um, and you know, either build a bridge or, you know, run a town or a city or whatever. And all these really interesting applications are being explored right now. There's actually this company, not even a company, it's just this random guy um, who I know from, from college who um, started this thing called City DAO. Um, where people are buying land and, you know, creating a whole DAO around um, a city, which is pretty cool. And so you can do like really crazy things with um, DAOs that maybe might not require a tax structure. That's fascinating. I don't know if John, you wanted to add it. On I, would, I would say probably the easiest way to tax just on a, on a practical level would be on wages. Um, when people pay, or an employer has to pay a wage, they report that wage. They already do it anyway, whether they pay you uh, via check or cash or dollars in a bank account, uh, that would be the easiest way to do it. Um, of course, there's ways to get around that, but those exist right now too. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's my initial thought on that. Awesome, thank yeah. you. Um, another question, how do you see the duality of the space's professionalism? So multi-billion um, TVLs, motorsport sponsors, sponsorships, and silliness, Dogecoins, um, impacting the adoption and perception of Web3. Sarah, you can take it now. Yeah. Um, how do I see it? How do I view it? I think it's awesome. Um, I mean, I think even outside of crypto, you've already seen like a huge wave of like memes and kind of silliness taking over. Uh, I mean, we saw that with GME. Uh, I just, I think that there's sort of a, a, a narrative of like um, new money and um, kind of beating out like old generational traditions and things like that. And so memes are a perfect representation and yeah, I love it. I think there's like portions you have to be careful of like scam tokens and, you know, um, uh, especially with project organizers that maybe don't have the best interests at heart in terms of like, you know. Oh, well, Sarah. I guess we'll wait to see if she can come back. Um, but do you want to answer I'll the question? Jump in. Uh, yeah. Look, in everything there, there's kind of both. I, the, the, the meme coins drive me a little bit crazy personally because there is so much great innovation and, and things happening that it does kind of give it a little bit of a silliness to it. But like Sarah said, I mean, the same thing happened with GameStop and 
and AMC and all these other stocks. I think there's a young, uh, a younger generation that's being priced out of a higher quality of life um, that is finding a way collectively to stick it to the incumbents, um, to the hedge funds, to whoever it may be, and that's their way of doing it. Um, and ultimately, though, on the dog coins or whatever kind of meme coins, they, they what they really do, aside from just, I, mean, I don't think they have much value, is that they, they create communities, right? So you have to think about these guys have communities. They they and then from that community, something innovative can sprout. But I think with any anything, there's always going to be that tail end that's that's a little silly or that's a little bit on the fringe. And I'd rather take take that than than, than depend on other things. Awesome, thank you. Um, there's actually a really interesting question of. How can I work in this ecosystem as a fresh grad from Lebanon? Are there any specific tools uh, people can focus on? Yeah, actually, I was talking to a student from AUB like a week or two ago, and he was asking me this question. Um, I think for the technically inclined, there's always, I think the biggest need, to be frank, is for technical people. So I would say um, two things. One, you can go very niche, so learn a coding language that is specific to a blockchain. Um, so, you know, with Avalanche, one of our chains is EVM compatible. That's a Ethereum virtual machine. So that's solidity. That's a very small niche, right? There's the demand for those developers. Uh, if it's Algora, if it's uh, Solana or others, they use Rust, um, Go, Python. I mean, you know, all these different kind of coding languages, there's always going to be a need for developers. There's never going to be enough developers. So that's the easiest route. Uh, conversely, I am not technical. I got into this field. Uh, I used to be in media and then I got in, I was in international trade for a while and you know, international trade stuff uh, and got into this personally myself. The way I got into it was that I spent all day reading about everything that I could. I started learning about the technology. So reading the Bitcoin white paper, um, other kind of, uh, you know, just knowing who's who, who's doing what, what differentiates them, who are the new players, who are the new protocols. That's always the best. When I talk to people that are going to join my team, at least on the business side, or if my marketing team is talking to someone on the marketing side, you know, an understanding of this space goes a long way. We have people that come to us from uh, Goldman or JP Morgan who are much older than me and much more seasoned than me or any of us. Um, and they want to get into crypto because they know that's where it's going to be going, but they don't know anything about crypto. There are real world kind of, uh, you know, skills, of course, that come from having that background. And there is a lack of that in this space, right? Um, some might say some lack of professionalism with some people or, or kind of the gravitas or authority, but you need to know the space to play in it, right? So read, you know, there's great uh, resources, Misari, M-E-S-S-A-R-I.com, uh, The Block. Those are crypto um, news outlets that are very credible. Those are run by journalists. Um, and, and, and I have like the best and greatest news um, and kind of research. So getting up to speed and knowing what's what and who's who is the best way to jump into this. Thank you. Uh, super helpful. Um, hey, hey guys, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry, my computer crashed weirdly. Okay. Um, so my, okay. I don't know, it won't let me turn my video on, but I, can I pop in and answer this question too, Yara? Of yes, of course. Um, Cool. I just wanted to drop something in the chat really quick, but if you're curious about moving into crypto, um, we have a whole job board set up through She256. And so I know someone earlier was looking to, to move into crypto and I would say definitely check out that list. Um, and I'm happy to be a resource um, for any introductions. If you see a company you like or anything at all, um, maybe Yara can also share my email. Um, or contact information, but I think there's a plethora of opportunities and no better time than to start looking now. So yeah, hopefully I can be of help there. Yeah, likewise. Uh, I would recommend people going to avalabs.org, uh, uh, checking out the job board. If there's anything that interests anyone, by all means, please send me a, a message and I'll route you to the, to the necessary people. Amazing, thank you. Um, we have a question actually about, um, I know China and crypto has been in the news a lot lately. So why did China prohibit crypto? Um, would it ne negatively affect our economy even, you know, long term? Would it hinder their, I guess, their progress? And then has any other Arab country done the same? Sarah, you want to jump in? 
Yeah, so I'm actually not, I don't know about any other Arab country doing the same. Um, yeah, I imagine this is going to be bad. I mean, I don't really know that much about like international relations and things like that. But what I do know is that you can't really shut down a blockchain. So like China blocking crypto is, um, I think it's more of like a political statement than like anything else. And so it affects crypto in that way. Um but, you know, you can still, quote unquote, use all of this technology. Um, it just is severely harder. Like you have to be a lot more technical. Maybe you're using a VPN. Maybe you're actually entirely interacting with blockchains through a terminal or like something something um, that's just uh, now more technologically um, difficult. Um, and so I think I think that affected um crypto in 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 sort of that sense like a setback in terms of like john and i were talking about the sort of on ramping and onboarding experience um yeah that that's kind of all i can talk about or that's all i can kind of contribute there to that question because i'm just i'm not an expertise in like um sort of these like international and political legal sort of affairs but maybe john you know more about some of the arab countries in my in my spare time i, I dive into policy stuff like i'm a huge policy wonk used to do a lot of international stuff um, oh great yeah. so i mean china it's very simple china just wants control right and this takes control away from them and it's two things it's one control and two capital flight so if you're familiar china used to uh, limit the amount of money people can send out of China. So with crypto and Bitcoin, it made it and, and, and all crypto, it made it really easy for people to bypass their traditional capital controls that the country had for people to withdraw their money. Um, so this is their attempt to do so. Um, but, but what does it mean they shut it down? They stop people from being able to mine. All the, all the exchanges that were based out of China have closed up shop and moved to Singapore or Taiwan or other jurisdictions, but they're still operating. And to Sarah's point, if anyone in China has a VPN, they can still log on, they can still do it. But what they did is kind of, yeah, cut off the, the, the capital access in and out. So getting into crypto and out of crypto. So if you're in it, you're in it right now. I don't know how you cash out per se. Um, uh, there's black markets. I know this happens in Lebanon where if someone has a bunch of crypto, they, they call a local guy because there's always a guy for everything in Lebanon. And he'll trade you your crypto for cash and you'll do the trade right there. Um, so, you know, it, you leave it to the Lebanese to find ingenuity out, uh, across. Uh, the banks don't work. Some guy with a, bu a bucket of cash does. Um, and then he'll send it out somewhere else and they'll exchange it that way. Um, ultimately, China, what China did is control. I don't think Arab countries have the organizational capacity to do this. Even if they try to shut it down, like we said, it's not going to work. It's just going to drive innovation elsewhere and money elsewhere. This is a really bad move, in my opinion, for China. They're just going to lose out on a lot of money and innovation rather than at the expense of a little bit or a, a kind of the imagination of control. And what you've seen is now all that hash power, that mining has come to West Texas to the United States. So it's a win for the U.S. and a loss for China. Yeah, makes sense. Um, one last question, um, and this one might hit close to home for a lot of us. Um, is there a path towards expat uh, rep Sorry, I'm going to butcher this word, but remit remittances um, in crypto in Lebanon. Sarah, you want to jump in? Yeah, um, totally. I mean, I think that that's one of the like main use cases of crypto, um, especially in um, you know countries as John mentioned before, Venezuela um, has seen a lot of this, especially actually with Bitcoin. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I would say the easiest thing is for everybody to find a way to create an account, whether it's an exchange account, an non-custodial wallet, you know, being meta, whether it be MetaMask, BRD, Coinomi, there's tons of all these wallets, right? Um, and people can just send remittances instantly. I mean, uh, you can send the transaction on the Avalanche blockchain, it'll, it'll settle in less than a second. Uh, so it's near instant. Um, but ultimately the goal being Again, you need to know or find out the guy who's going who's gonna to convert it back uh, to cash for people to use the real world. Um, it's ripe for some kind of, you know, for people to be taken advantage in that way. So I think that educational barrier, that learning curve needs to be understood first. And then once it is, yeah, you're, you're, you're good to go. Yeah, makes sense. 
Well, thank you both so much. Um, so thank you to our panelists. This was so informative. I know I learned so much and I hope um, everyone else did. And then thank you for everyone who joined today on this Thursday to learn more about crypto with us. Um, I hope you also learned a lot. Um, I'll pass it over to Janina Kiki, LabNet's um, Executive Director to go over LabNet's upcoming events and initiatives. Um, and again, thank you so much to Sarah and John. This was amazing. Yes, I second Thanks, that, Yana. Yeah, Go ahead, go ahead, Sarah, please. Oh, I was just gonna say thank you. This was awesome and, and good to meet you, John. Yeah, likewise. Hopefully hopefully a Uniswap Avalanche uh, partnership comes out of this too. <laughs> and, and I second uh, that you guys uh, were amazing and you held up the attendees all the way to the end. Usually they start trickling out uh, way before the end of the event. And uh, John, you cracked me up with your uh, trying to explain cryptocurrency to your mom. I you know my son's tried and he got me actually to invest. And I'm constantly after him saying this better work out. So, <laughs> so I'm in. Uh, thank you so much for all the info, John and Sarah and Diara. You did an amazing job moderating. Thank you. Quickly, uh, LevNet's up upcoming events. We're very, very busy. Uh, if you're in the New York area, there is a monthly networking event now in person. Uh, so please feel free to join that. Uh, there is an upcoming LevNet holiday party where we're going to do a wine tasting featuring wines from Hamdun, Lebanon, uh, as well as uh, an award ceremony to follow that. Uh, that's December 15th, so please save the date. Uh, we have an upcoming webinar in uh, Q1 of 22 uh, on uh, pre precision healthcare. If you know of anyone who's a subject matter expert, please let us know. And then we have the monthly podcast uh, for Brothers Talk in Tech. You can catch that on lebnet.us uh, website. As far as initiatives, there is a lot going on. Uh, if you'd like to get involved, please reach out to me. Uh, we're very heavy in mentorship. We're doing early in career, uh, 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 basically people, uh, professionals less than five years are participating in mentoring students at AUB. And also we're doing mem uh, webinars for students at AUB with uh, the first topic as graduate school applications. Uh, we're trying to automate the men mentorship process. We have an app that we're porting with the help of the women in tech and the early in career uh, communities at, at LabNet. We have launched the internship, uh, uh, um, our internship season where we ask uh, companies who have internships uh, opening if they would like to give us first tips and uh, our students of Lebanese descent. Uh, so please reach out to me if you have such opportunities. We also have university partnerships with AUB and LAU where we try to line up subject matter experts from the industry here to participate in lectures and webinars in Lebanon. Uh, it's all virtual. And then uh, we're, we're fundraising to continue these amazing initiatives and events. Uh, so if you're interested in subscribing, please do so. Any questions, any interest, reach out to me. I'd, I'd be glad to talk to you. And thank you so much for joining us, all the attendees today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. And I think that's it up. All right. Thank you, everyone. Awesome.